start to start the recording and let us know that um, Sister Ernestine Johnson has joined us, has blessed us with her beautiful presence. We're going to go ahead and uh, say our opening prayer. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, once again, we just want to thank you. We are so grateful and appreciative of all of the many blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day that fall fresh upon us. We thank you for life. We thank you for health. We thank you for strength. We thank you for the continued hedge of protection you put around us and our families. We thank you for healing. We thank you for strength and power of the Holy Spirit that falls fresh upon us every day. Now, thank you for this time we have with each other today that we can grow with, num with one another, that we can gain fresh knowledge and wisdom, a fresh revelation from you on how we can serve our purpose in you, that we can do your will in your way. So clear our hearts and minds of all of the busyness of the world. Let us now join together in, in this moment that we can lift up a joyful noise to you through our praise, our witness, our testimony, and go forward from this time to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Okay, as we always do, we'll, we'll start off with the, um, uh, with, with the time from Rick, Rick, Rick Warren and discuss the, uh, discuss the opening chapter summary. Chapter 37 is a very exciting chapter that you're going to need some extra time on. After you've read it, you're going to need at least an hour or two to put into action what I've asked you to do in this chapter. It's called sharing your life message. Part of your life mission is your life message. Did you know that God wants to say something through you that he can say only through you? That's called your life message. And there are four parts to your life message. First, there is your testimony. That's your story of how you began a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you're the authority on that. Nobody else can share your testimony. And if you don't share your testimony, nobody ever is going to hear that story. So part of your life message is your testimony of how you came to know Jesus. The second is your life lessons. And those are the important lessons that you learned in your life. And I hope you actually will write them down in a journal. Now, I'm not talking about a diary. A diary is when you write down what you did. Today, I went to the store. A journal is what you learned. You write down, this is what I learned today. And that can be passed on from generation to generation. It's part of your life message. A third part of your life message are your godly passions. There are certain things that you feel called to do. You know, some people feel really passionate about the environment. And other people say, yeah, I know the environment's important, but what I really care about is orphans. And some people say, yeah, I know 146 million orphans in the world. That's a big issue. But what I really care about is helping Christians grow. And some people say, yeah, I know helping Christians grow is important. But what I'm really passionate about is helping people come to know Christ who don't know Jesus yet, who headed into a crisis eternity. And others say, well, yeah, I know that's important, but I care really about it. And they'll name something else. Have you noticed that we all like to do different things and we all feel passionate about different things? That's intentional. God did it so that everything in the world would get done. If we all like to do the same thing, there would a lot be left undone. So your life message involves your testimony. It involves uh, your life lessons, the things that God teaches you through your experiences of life. It involves your godly passions, what you feel the most interest and in calling to. And it involves, number four, the good news, which is common to all of us, that Jesus Christ died on the cross. He died for our sins. He was a substitute for our sins. He paid a debt that we could not pay. The Bible says, him who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God. And that we are justified through faith in him, just as we, we trust our in Christ to do what we could not do for ourselves. Heaven is a perfect place, and I'm not perfect. And the only way I could get into heaven is on his 
imputed righteousness. In other words, what he has done for me that I could not do for myself. That's the good news. And in this chapter, you're going to read how to discover and develop your life message. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so we, we thank God for uh, Pastor Warren and getting us started off on this important lesson. And this lesson is, is, is really one of the signature lessons of, of this entire purpose-driven life. And as he has shared already, uh, it's gonna take a lot to dive into this. So let's make sure that we take the opportunity now uh, to begin to be reflective in this, not only for this moment, but how we can truly take this with us and understand how this is so core to who we are supposed to be in Christ and carry out our purpose. So sharing your life message becomes so, so important. It says here in the, in the scripture lessons, and we're gonna add a few more to this, that those who believe in the son of God have the testimony of God in them. That's a powerful word. Those who believe in the son of God have the testimony of God in them. Your lives are echoing the master's word. The news of your faith in God is out. We don't even have to say anything anymore. You are the message. And then, and then one of the other things we add to this is, and, and I want somebody to find it for us now in, in uh, Acts um, chapter uh, one, uh, verses, uh, we're going to talk about verses uh, seven, eight, and nine and, and focus on, on those for a moment. But if someone would find that, and we're, and we're going to read those a little bit later. But but the, the but the component here that I want, want want us to understand is is that we have been given authority and power, and the, and a significant component of that is that we must share it. We we are driven to share this, and and that's what we need to focus on today. God has given you a life message for you to share it, not for you to internalize it and keep it to yourself, but to share it. When you became a believer, you also became God's messenger. We've talked about being ambassadors. You have an anointing. Each one of you has an anointing on you that falls fresh on you through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are supposed to be using. God wants to speak through us by the power and authority that has been embedded on, in us that was guaranteed through the spirit. Paul said, we speak the truth before God as messengers of God. And we have to understand that we're supposed to be speaking that same truth in our own voice, in our own way, with our own passion. So you, you may feel that you don't have anything to share. And I, I know sometimes we can all feel like that, that you know we have challenges in our lives, we have things that we're going through, but that's the devil trying to keep us silent. I know each one of you and each one of you has something amazing to share. You have something amazing to share, why? Because you have, an individual testimony that nobody else has. You have some life lessons that you have learned, that wisdom and experience that you have achieved through the, through the years that, that you can share for someone else. And you have passion that is unique to you, that's different from other people that you can share. And then we can all together share the good news. So as we talk today, we're going to be discussing these points and challenging ourselves to say, I don't have to be a teacher. I don't have to be a preacher. I don't have to be a prophet. But I do have a life that God has blessed me with, that his hand has been upon, that needs to be shared with the world because there's someone else out there that needs to be touched in the same way that I have been touched. So I want somebody to, to, to uh, start us off here um, and, and, and read about the message, the message that comes through your testimony, if you would read now. Anybody? 
This is from Acts 1. You want to read? No, no, no. Read what's on the screen right now. Oh, read what's on the screen. Your life message includes your testimony. Your testimony is a story of how Christ has made a difference in your life. Peter tells us that we were chosen by God to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you. This is the essence of witnessing, simply sharing your personal experiences regarding the Lord. In a courtroom, a witness isn't expected to argue the case, prove the truth, or press for a verdict. That is the job of attorneys. Witnesses simply report what happened to them or what they saw. Jesus <clears throat> said, you will be my witnesses, not you will be my attorney. He wants you to share your story with others. Sharing your testimony is an essential part of your mission on earth because it is unique. There is no other story just like yours. So only you can share it. If you don't share it, it will be lost forever. You may not be a Bible scholar, but you are the authority on your life and it's hard to argue with personal experience. Actually, your personal testimony is more effective than a sermon because unbelievers see pastors as professional salesmen, but see you as a satisfied customer. So they give you more credibility. Amen. 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 Now that's 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 amazing, and 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 I really liked this um, uh, first first passage here. Because uh, one breaks it down, we can all be witnesses. We might not have the best theological skills or or prophetic skills or anything, but we are all witnesses. One of the first calls to action that Jesus gave in 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 the book of Acts uh, that we talked about, that we were we were just referencing sa says in verse eight but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses, my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus has said to us, you will be my witnesses in all the earth and you will have power. This witnessing will be made manifest in you because you will have power that comes from the Holy Spirit. Now, as believers in Jesus Christ, we know we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What is that Holy Spirit in us for? It's certainly a guarantee or a deposit for our salvation. It certainly convinces and convicts us of our sinful nature, but it also is power. There's power in the Holy Spirit that we should be using now to go forward and provide our testimony to the world. You know, our personal stories are so, so important and they're a lot easier to relate to than, than, than principles. Um, and, and really, although we don't think so, people love to hear, hear them. You know, each one of you has a personal story that can be utilized to encourage somebody else. That's a much better than quote, quoting theologians, even though that's that's wonderful. It's much better than it's it's wonderful to quote scripture. But when we can have say and witness of what God has done in your life, that can have a dramatic impact on someone else. The value of your testimony also is that it it will will take down or bypass intellectual defenses. You know, it's easy to get into intellectual arguments with people. Uh, it's easy uh, for people to feel like they can intellectually joust with you about some part of religion, something they've read somewhere that would, would undermine our belief in Jesus Christ. But, but I'm always drawn back to what the blind man said when there was a debate about whether or not 
Jesus did exactly what he did to allow the, the, the blind man to see. And that was the power of his testimony, which was that you can argue over the theology. I don't know anything about all of that, but one thing I do know, I was blind and now I can see. See, that's irrefutable and that's the personal witnessing and testimony. Each one of us here right now has something that we can acknowledge. When somebody sees the joy that Sister Alice has for her work in the Lord, when somebody when somebody sees the diligence in the work that that Pat does or that that Ken Moss does, you can then go and and you can ask them about it and, and talk about I try to talk about what principles that rely upon. But the greatest, easiest way to focus with someone is to let them know what the power of your testimony is. You know, in the book of Revelation, it says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the power of our testimony. So testimony is a major component that we all have that we should be using in our walk in order to in order to witness you know it, it is a powerful part of the way that we fulfill god's purpose in our lives the bible says to be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope you have and again this is about our personal relationship what my life was like before i met jesus how i realized i needed jesus how I committed my life to Jesus and the difference that Jesus has made in my life. Now notice what's in all of that. In each one of those points, it's this is the time when it's about me. See, it's about me. It's not about what happened to somebody else. It's not about what I knew about my mama. It's not what I knew about my brother. It's not what, what happened with Reverend Matthews this, and how, how great his message. This is what is important in my life and what it means to me. Now, what can, can, we, can we then begin to take that level of testimony and build it into our own personal story? You each have a compelling story. And you say, well, Ray, you don't know my story. I know enough about each one of you that's on this phone right now, or most of you anyway, to know that you have a compelling story of uh, that can say like the psalmist, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? So, so we need to think about that. And I want each of you now to, to, to begin to reflect on that because I, I hope that some of you will be able to share as we continue to go through this lesson in a meaningful way that will help us all understand these particular points. That, we've, that Jesus made a change in us, that that change then and the power, the conviction of the Holy Spirit had me to realize how much I needed Jesus in order to live and survive and how committing my life to Jesus made brought a new joy into my life and into your life and what that difference truly means. So reflect on that. The second part of this is we have all lived long enough to learn lessons. Some have been wonderful lessons. Some have been very, very hard lessons. But through, through it all, Jesus was the constant. Our relationship with God was constant, even when he felt distant, even when we were distant, God was always there. So in our relationships and our problems and our temptations, we have come to know that God was always with us. David prayed, God teach me lessons for living so I can stay the course. We've learned these lessons now through trials and tribulations, heartache and pain, sunshine and rain. Now, can we share that 
with others and feel comfortable in sharing it. Not that we would boast, but that we would share this is how God has made a difference in our lives. We, we learn from experience, but again, it's wiser to learn from the experience of others. Have we all had people in our own lives that showed a way for us that we stand on the shoulders of folks who were wiser than us that helped to show us the way? There certainly isn't enough time for us to learn everything on our own. And we can move farther through life when we share lessons and learn from one another. So can we share some lessons today? Can, can, we, can, we, use, can we use one another's life ex lessons and experiences in order to uplift, uplift and edify the body of Christ? It says, the Bible says, a warning given by an experienced person to someone willing to listen is more valuable than jewelry made of the finest gold. And we all know that. We all know that. We know how valuable life lessons are. So I want to talk a little bit about this now. This, 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 uh, I want to talk about uh, a couple of these. And we, we look at, uh, as R Pastor Warren has asked us, is to write, write down some major lessons you have learned. And we don't, we don't need to try to write anything down now. Um, but we do hope that, that you will reflect on some of these and, 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 and look into uh, yourselves about some of these questions and how they relate to your life. Um, imagine some of the frustrations that we have gone through in life because we didn't learn a lesson early enough or because we didn't listen to a life lesson from somebody that we knew had wisdom, but we were um, yet blinded and had scales on our eyes to what we could receive from that person. But as we mature, mature people develop the habit of extracting lessons from everyday experiences and everyday relationships. So, so we want to talk about some of these, and, and some of these might be more important than others. But here are the questions, and I just want you know you to you to think about these. And anybody who would like to raise a point on any of these, please feel free to do so. But here are the questions for us to reflect upon. What has God taught me from failure? What has God taught me from a lack of money? What has God taught me from pain or sorrow or depression? What has God taught me through waiting? What has God taught me through illness? What has God taught me from disappointment? What has what have I learned from my family, my church, my relationships, my small group, and my critics? So let's take a minute and just look over that list. And does anybody want to share on their personal reflection on any one of those questions? Not everybody at once. Okay, well, I, I'll I'll talk talk a little bit. Um, what has God taught me through waiting? You know, one of the things that um, has always impacted me is that you want what you want and you want it now. Uh, we no longer even live in a microwave generation. We, 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 we now live in a swipe generation where you've got your phone and all you want to do is, you know, you, you now can pick up your phone and you can order anything from around the world uh, with, this, with this phone or with your iPad. And you just go onto that site and you just swipe, swipe and immediately it's already, it, it's already ordered and on the way. Well, God doesn't operate like that. And that's something that I have had to learn that I've got to wait, but that waiting and a delay is not necessarily a denial. Uh, and I have to reflect on that over and over because I'm ready for things to be done. I'm ready for things to, to, to be fulfilled right now. 
but we have learned that patience is a virtue. I have learned it. And I have learned to practice patience, to actually to know that that's something I've got to practice. And when I say practice patience, for me, that means that I have to walk out, step out on faith and walk in the knowledge that if what God has for me is for me, and it's going to come in due season, but I got to act like I already have it by going and continuing to do the work that God is calling me to do and not simply literally waiting around for something to happen and not fulfilling what God has for me and fulfill. There's some of the things in other categories that we can all reflect on. So look at these questions later. Uh, if no one wants to share right now. Ray, this is, yeah. this is Ray Matthews. Uh, I would like to share on the one, what has God taught me, taught me through illness? Most of you know that I'm on the transplant list for a new kidney. I've been waiting for three and a half, almost four years now. And if anything God is teaching me is patience and to be well until God opens that door. So, you know, you go through why me, why, why, and, uh, but the one I refuse to do is to give up and to succumb, that you can live victoriously whatever comes into your life. You can live victoriously. And under good, solid physician care and a good diet, um, I've been able to maintain and not miss anything. Um, but um, God has taught me to be patient, to heal, don't get into the woe is me or why me or anything like that, but um, has taught me that this is well with my soul. God has been teaching me a lot in over four years. And so I am thankful that what God has taught me through this, which is to be still, uh, be patient, trust him and not myself and anything else. So through illnesses and the challenges that we have, God is always teaching us. There's always a teaching moment somewhere if we be still enough and don't get ahead of God. Don't question God. Don't get into a fight with God, but just be still and say, God, I will trust you and your will be done. So through my illness, I have learned to not claim it as an illness, but I am being healed as I live. And that's what I want to share. Amen. And right. Mine, I was trying to get in, mine is on illness also, but it's illness from the standpoint of uh, what I went through over 10 years with my parents' illness. And it, it really taught me that God is really in control, that uh, uh, he's going to take care of. It's, we know that God uh, has something planned for all of us. And it really made me think about, you know, what, what he has in store for me. We were able to go through all of that. And for to just be around mama and dad, and mama especially when she was unable to express anything to us. The, the patience that I had and the relief that I had was knowing that God would take care of it. He will handle it. He's never going to leave you. That whatever is planned for you already it will happen and just understand that have faith and boy you really have some faith and trust because there's nothing else that you can do so i'm thankful for that when you know do all you can while you can and leave it up to god and that's how i was able to get through all of those years amen amen <laughs> thanks you know. yes go ahead uh, hey, this is uh, Richard Mustang. Um, and the one that um, I want to reflect on was what have I learned from my family, my church, my relationships, my small group, and my critics? Um, mostly uh, reflecting on my family and my church and my relationships. Um, because that you know, once I had become chronic in 2014 with my lymphedema, I, I had really, I had really started to turn within myself, and um, you know, just really started to 
pulling weight for anybody and everybody. And um, wanted to just be, be alone and be by myself. But at the same time, if I'm being very honest, at the same time, was wanting somebody to call and ask about me, was wanting for somebody to call and check on me. And then when they did it, I would get upset at them. When, and, and, and to be perfectly honest, I was being out of line by doing that because I'm assuming because you don't see me, then something must be wrong with me. Something must be going on. Why aren't you calling and checking up on me to see if I'm all right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's silly. That was silly for me to be thinking that way. Sometimes, you know, it, it's okay to reach out and tell folks, hey, here's some challenges that I'm dealing with right now. So please pray for me, you know, I, and, and, and I love your support in any way that you can give it. You know, there's an old saying, uh, and, 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 it's, and it's, not a, um, it's not a gospel or church saying, it's just a secular saying, out of sight, out of mind. And a lot of times, you know, when I was just sitting around being mad and upset and Going through what was what was eventually found out to be a real bout of depression, you know, you start to, to, to be angry, or I, I will say I, I started to become angry and disappointed and sad, all of these other things. But also, it came from a negative place of pride because I didn't want to ask anybody for help. I didn't want to ask anybody to to just kind of look after, you know, check in on me every once in a while. And and that's just not a way to be when you have a family, which I do, when you have a church family, which I do, and when I have relationships in both my family and my church family. And, uh, and so what I grew out of that is to stop being so selfish with what I believe should be my, my health. And and, 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 and and reach out and, and, and receive. Not when, when people receive me, I should also receive them back. And I believe that this small group, which is another one of the words of this, is something that grew out of that. And I cannot be more thankful uh, and cannot thank God enough for this small group that I, that, that, that you know, you all love. Uh, allow me to sit with you in it. So that's that's kind of where I am. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thanks for thanks to everybody for sharing. Um and recognize that we can all point to virtually every question on this list in some kind of way and raise up a me message out of it that can be a, a, a an, an experience that's relatable to someone else. And we just have to look deep into ourselves and figure out by the the uh holy spirit working in us how we can use our responses to these questions to help others you know we we have to remember that also that our life message includes sharing our godly passions you know we we serve a passionate god we serve a good God, but we serve a passionate God. He passionately loves you and me. He loves some things and passionately hates some other things. As we grow closer to him, he gave us a passion for us to care deeply about, and he wants us to speak that passion to the world. You know, as Pastor Warren said, the great thing about God is that he planted passions in each one of us for different things, but they're all necessary in order to bring the edification of the of the body of the body of Christ and to uplift his kingdom in the world so he doesn't want one person's passions to be left to the side it's just like spiritual gifts 
our passion should be utilized in order to complement one another and lift up and edify the body of Christ. So whatever your passion is, you need to speak it, speak up about it, and use it to make a difference. You know, again, we don't need to keep these passions to ourselves. You know, we we got to tell it. We we got to get it out. We need to speak it so that our hearts will be known to man and they know where our joy comes from. They will know what is the center of our joy, the source of our joy by the way we by how we're passionate about it. You know, a lot of times we 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 want to uh, don't want to appear to be overzealous. But right now, it's like David said, my zeal for God and his work burns hot within me. You know, Paul said that that we should be fanning the flame. Fan the flame of your passion that it will that it will burn hot for Jesus. Your message burns in my heart and bones and I cannot keep silent. We need to generate that, to build that up inside of us and release it. And God is asking us to do it. Will we fan the flame or we do, will, will we let the uh, embers slowly burn out? God gives some people a godly passion to champion a cause. And it's often a, it's often a problem they personally experience such as abuse, addiction, infertility, depression, cancer, whatever the case may be. And, 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 and it's amazing how God gives people a passion to speak up for a group of others who can't speak for themselves. That's an amazing part of who Jesus is, that he thought it not robbery to come to earth to experience in human form, and be an example of what it can be even when we're persecuted, poor and imprisoned as, as the, the uh, scriptures have taught, even when justice is denied, God expects those to come to the defense of the defenseless. And we have that opportunity to do that in whatever, whatever area there is. There's an opportunity to, to come to the defense of people. You know, it, it was amazing um, that uh, what we saw when, when with the passing of Chadwick Boseman uh, and, uh, and for a while people didn't know what was going on with him, but then you find out that over the past four years he had been dealing with colon cancer and had made some amazing films that were uplifting to the African-American community and, and the world in general. But he still found time not only to do that amazing work, but to go and visit with, 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 with children who were cancer patients at hospitals like St. Jude. And, and you, you, you wonder if he had not had to go through what he was going through. Would he have been as would he have been as passionate about that? Maybe so, but we know that we know that God gives us a passion to champion for those groups who can't speak for themselves, like those little children. And He's given us opportunities to do something similar. Chadwick didn't do it for praise or glory. He did it because he was passionately touched. There, there are opportunities for us to be touched. Are we prepared to listen to that still small voice, soft voice that's speaking to us about something that we should be passionate about? Whatever that is, whatever that is, we need to listen to that call. You may be given, you've probably been given some godly passion. 
I see your passions at work in many ways. God is saying, hey, everybody, fan the flame even more. Use the power of the Holy Spirit even more with whatever group, particular groups he is bringing in front of you. We know that God is already at work and he wants us to join him in, in his work. And we can join him in his work through our passion that we have. God gives us all these different passions and so that everything he wants done in this world can be done. So we, so, so our challenge is, again, we must listen to and value each other's life message because we can't say it all and we got to encourage one another to, to, to use our passion. You know, one of the most passionate people, you know, that, that I love, she's quiet normally and that, that and that's, that, that's Sister Pat. Uh, I tell you, but, but we know, and that's one of the things I miss about being in church right now is, is that uh, when it's time for us to have praise and worship, <laughs> or, or when the gospel choir is going to sing, we know you got to give Pat Bennett room for her to praise God. She's passionate about showing God her praise, and that lifts everybody up mm -hmm. to see her um, passionate. And I tell you what, if you don't give her room, you 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 might get bumped in the side because <laughs> she's gonna, she's going to she's going to do. She's going to be passionate. She's going to be zealous for <laughs> praising the Lord. And that's a beautiful thing to see. And that, that fans the flame for everybody in that worship service. But in the same way, each of you has that. The passion and the care that I see when I see Sister Alice that would be painstakingly uh, preparing for for things like, like All Saints Sunday and the meticulous way she wants to make sure that she takes care of the families of those who will light candles. So from All Saints to, to, to baptisms, the meticulous care that she gives, she's passionate about it. We all have passions that we share, that we share with one another to fan the flame, to elevate what's important. So let's continue to be, so don't, don't do what some people will do and say, well, why, why is so-and-so so doing all of that? All of that's not necessary. Now you've got to do what God is calling you to be zealous about. It says, it is fine to be zealous provided the purpose is good. And that's what we got to remember. If when your zeal is for the Lord, you just tell people to step aside because what you're doing, you're doing for Jesus. Hey, Ray. Yes. And, and do you mind if I add one more that I'm just grinning ear to ear about? Sure. Whenever we would sing a hymn in the church and we're headed to the last stanza, and the way David still used to set up that last, last stanza, or the yes. that he would play with the organ. And you might get almost 30 seconds to a minute of him just playing and playing a fanfare. And by the time we get to the time we're supposed to sing that last stanza, oh my God, you want to talk about the Holy Spirit going to the church. And we are singing from twice as loud as the rest of them. And man, that used to be so, so passionate and beautiful. It was just amazing. I just wanted to say that real quick. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now, nah, it's very, very, very well said. Very well said. Your life message also includes the good news. And the good news we all know is the gospel of Jesus Christ that shows how God makes people right with himself and that it begins with faith. Faith. We all know that, that, that God allow Christ to come into the world in order to reconcile the world to himself. We've shared before about the fact that we all have the ministry of reconciliation. 
We all have that ministry and we are asked to, to, to use now our life lessons, our testimony, our passion in order to put forth that message to others through those components. Again, it's not about whether or not we can be a, a preacher or a teacher or a prophet. It's about using what God has given us to share in the good news. And that good news is that when we trust God's grace to save us through what Jesus did, our sins are forgiven. We get purpose for living and we are promised a future in heaven. Yeah, that is all a part of it and it's manifest uh, right now. We should be showing it right now because as, as, as pastor, to paraphrase him, he, he has said to us before, we, are all, we already have salvation. Eternity has already started. It has already started for us. Can we share that good news? That has been guaranteed to us by the power of God's grace and our belief in Jesus Christ. We have access by faith to this grace. We have been justified by faith and have access through Jesus Christ. So let's use that, 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 that our gratefulness, our thanksgiving and demonstrate it by using all of these resources that are at our disposal to serve God and share the good news. You know, there, there are some, some, some um, books in the appendix that we can look at. We're gonna be coming, we're almost at the end of this um, Bible study that's been fantastic. And we're gonna be thinking about and reflecting on what is our next small group study that we can use to extend this. So I, 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 I ask everyone now to start thinking about that. Is there something else that we can, we can continue uh, to build upon what we are learning here to go to higher heights and deeper depths? Uh, the Bible says God does not want anyone to be lost, but he wants all people to change their hearts and lives. You are already on that process, everyone that's on this call. And everyone that's in the sound of my voice that has, that has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and, and has received the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, in that, in that, in, in that uh, scripture that we read from Acts, Jesus didn't say, you will get the power of the Holy Spirit. Now you need to kick back and study and go to the temple and read and, and uh, get a master's degree in theology. You need to become my witnesses. Now, you must keep praying now, serving now in love, sharing the good news, witnessing now throughout all the earth. We have the opportunity to do that in a small way, but wherever we plant a seed, someone else will witness and water, but the beauty is God gets the increase. So let's continue in our passion. What are we willing to do? What are you willing to do to know that you influenced someone to make the decision that allowed them to go to heaven? Do you invite them to church? Do you, do you give them this book? Do you invite them to the, the um, book review? Share your story. Give them bag lunches uh, like we do every, every couple of weeks. Intercessory prayer. All of these things we are doing, the, the point here is that the mission field is not somewhere overseas. The mission field is all around us. God has given us the Holy Spirit to give us discernment. Now let's open our eyes and see where God is calling us to be witnesses and in mission for him right before our eyes. 
Are we making the most of our chances? Am I making the most of mine? We all get caught up in the business of the world, but now is the time to be wise in all our contacts and all our time that we can put it forth and do what God is calling us to do. We know that God has never made a person he didn't love. Everybody matters to him. So we should do what we can to be God's arms and hands and feet and stretch out to him, stretch out to those who in some way might be unlovable now, but guess what? We at one point in time were unlovable. We might not want to admit it, but, but we have been. And so for us, the, the example of Christ that he died for our sins should and, and should convince us that as he died for all, it's our mission to extend that out into the world. So whenever you feel apathetic about your mission in the world, spend some time thinking about what Jesus did for you on the cross personally, what he did for me personally should change the way I view what I need to do in life. We have to care about unbelievers and we have to care about what it is that we can do to show the love of Christ because there is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. A parent will run into a burning building and says to save a child because their love for that child is greater than their fear. You know, it's been said that there is that that courage doesn't mean the absence of fear. It just means that there is something greater than that fear that pushes it to the side in order that that objective would be accomplished. Ask God to fill your heart in that same way that you can step out. We you know, just saw an example. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying, we just saw a practical example of that mother's love in the news this week where this woman jumped out of that car with, with her baby. Uh, a man was kidnapped, was uh, carjacking them. And then another mother who fought off uh, an attacker took his gun and shot him trying to protect her, her child. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you all heard that, those stories, that, that's a mother's love, overcoming the fear uh, of being of your own danger. Amen. Yeah, that, 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 that's amazing. That's amazing. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing. So our love for Christ now challenges us because of his love for us we have to demonstrate that agape love, that, in, that, that unconditional love, that in spite of, not because of love, needs to be demonstrated in the way that we carry forth our passions, share our life lessons, and share our testimony. So as we move forward um, with this book, uh, and what we've learned and, and the purposes for our, our lives, we need to challenge ourselves. Are, are, we, are we going to be magnifiers of God's glory through our own testimony? Are we going to be ministers of God's grace through our life lessons and the passions we share in our, our experience? And are we going to commit ourselves to demonstrate the good news in the works we do. You know, as the gospel song says, let the works I do speak for me. God is asking that we speak loudly through our works. There's only certain work. It says you, got, you need to do the work while it is yet light. The challenge is for us to do the work while the sun still shines. Let's spread the good news. It's important 
you only have this short, a short time because we can only work uh, during this day. So as we we close this lesson, um, we we look toward the point to ponder. God wants to say something to the world through me, through you, through each one of us. The verse to remember says, be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope you have, maybe the joy you have that is in you, but do it with gentleness and respect. And the question to consider is, as I reflect on my personal story, who does God want me to share it with? Who is it now that you can witness to, okay, during this season, that we want to share with you know we we uh, we we've been taught we've been reflecting and in, in our uh, weekly production meetings for our streaming service that that we we want to challenge everybody right now to to share our service share the the experience that we have uh, with others on Sunday morning to create something that that might be a small way for us to share the good news with other folks and, and be able to stimulate a conversation with people that we normally wouldn't by virtue of having a new platform uh, just via a link that we can share and say, hey, did you get a chance to hear Reverend Matthews? He, 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 pe he preached on such and such. I really got something out of it. I think you might like it. There are ways for us to reflect on personally what we're doing and even in the midst of this time when we are socially and uh, physically distanced, but we're still spiritually together where we can make a difference and continue to share. So with that, we end today. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, are there any um, uh, final reflections on the lesson today? Ray, I have one. This is Lucy Harrington. Hey, Lucy, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm a little emotional, so I'm going to try to get through this. But this is a personal experience that I had. Um, uh, I won't say that it was a standoff feeling in my heart. It wasn't physically, but um, I can honestly say, and I'm going to call her name because this person actually transformed my life um, at a time that I didn't see it as being negative. And that was, uh, and I hope she doesn't mind it, and that was Jackie Rowe. Uh, I remember an incident that, and God had to work on me with this, that um, we was having this reception at church and it was so pretty and so nice and neat. And uh, you know how the people off the street would just come in. And I was standing there one day and we was having this nice reception and I said to myself, I said, I said to Jackie, I said, these people that are coming off the street. I said, and they, they don't look appealing to, you know, indulge and they haven't cleaned their hands and what have you. And Jackie humbled me and I will never forget that. She says, Lucy, she said, Christ said, come as you are. And we ought to accept people the way that they are. And she says, so it doesn't matter what they look like when they come to the church and how they come in here. She said, we're supposed to treat them and love them the same way. Now, it's not that I didn't love them, but it's just that at that time, I just felt like, in, in all honesty, that that shouldn't be a part of them. And that's, that's a true feeling, that's a true confession. But Jackie opened up my eyes and she made me see things that I, that, that I didn't realize was hidden in my heart. And from that day forward, I have gained a, a lot of respect and regard from her. I don't know if she knows this or not, maybe I've told her, but it's just that we can have things hidden in us that we don't realize until somebody bring it out of us. And I am so ever grateful for her for that. Then God wasn't finished with me then. <laughs> I was at the church another time. And um, the, uh, Miss Twig, I'm calling names because this is this is passionate to me. 
And the people were coming off the street, and they was my twigs were feeding them to get regular dinner. And this man came up to Miss Twigs, and, and, and God knows he was nothing that we would say that we want to embrace and hug. That man walked up to Miss Twigs, and she had just, I think she had been sick or something, but she was back there. And she had returned back to the church, and he walked up to Miss Twigs. And I was standing there and he hugged her and she hugged him so passionately back. And another one came off the street and he was hugging her. And I said to myself, I said, now, Miss Twiggs, uh, you being exposed, you don't, to myself, I didn't say this verbally. And then all at once, God answered me. He says, but I'm protecting her. I'm covering her. She's okay. And that was an eye waking to me again. So God has revealed things to me through other people that he has broken me and he's still breaking me in certain areas. Now, that's my confession and that's my passion that I have gained through seeing how other people receive. And then finally, another man walked in. He says, I've been away from you a long time. He says, and he told Mrs. Twiggs, he said, but I have missed your smile, and it means so much to me. He says, I've been gone over a year. He said, but I couldn't wait to get back to this church just for you to smile. So I just wanted to um, express the things that right there in Warren that God has allowed me to see and be a part of to make me become more compassion to other people when I meet them. And that has broken me, and I am glad about the exposure that God allowed me to see. That's Amen. what I wanted to see. Amen. 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 Thanks for that powerful testimony. Now, Lucy, I'll have to go in and wash my face because the tears are just, the tears are just falling. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, I my know. God. I know. <laughs> I know, and coming from and coming from a person who herself is so compassionate, uh, and uh, and a servant uh, to so many people, I see what Lucy I see what Lucy does, and and how she responds to a need. Mm -hmm. and I, I, yeah. <laughs> oh my she, God! My she, God! My God! Praise the Lord! Praise the Bless Lord! You, Lucy. Yes, All right. Um, any 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 other final thoughts? Uh, if not, then I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording at this point, and um, we will now talk, go 